go. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Charlie Coster. I work for Aperture. Uh, I want to just uh, talk about Elm. It's a, a functional reactor programming language that I've been trying to learn recently because I thought it was really cool, so I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, so, so first, the really scary part, uh, it's, a, it's its own language. It's a functional reactor programming language that compiles to JavaScript. So it's, it's a functional language for the web. It uh, has pure functions, immutable uh, data, uh, automatic memoization, uh, monads-ish. So th that's the scary part. I, I'm not going to teach you Elm in five minutes. I, I know that's kind of unrealistic. Uh, but what I do want to do is show you three demos that kind of show you how cool it is to me. And I know you might not understand the syntax entirely, but I think you'll, you'll get cool little bits of it. So in this first demo, I want to show how pure functions and immutable data and declarative views allow you to very succinctly uh, create a, a very, you know, some kind of program here. So this is obviously rotating around an axis, uh, following my cursor around. And if you look at that code, uh, you see it's pretty simple. It's just some function that takes in uh, two tuples, uh, so x, y coordinates, uh, which is your mouse position and the width and height of the window. And we say we want a polygon with three sides, so a triangle and a, a basically a polygon with six sides. And so what I want to point out here is the, the declarative nature of Elm. Uh, and it's kind of like React in the, in the sense that you don't say how to render uh, your views. You just say, uh, and I hope you can read that, wave me down if you can't read that. Uh, you say how to re render your views, sorry, you say what to render but not how to render. Uh, and so Elm takes care of a lot of that for you. And so just try and imagine what it would take to do that in JavaScript uh, be you know, somewhat difficult. Um, Elm's recommended architecture uh, is sort of flux-like. Not sort of, it is flux-like and actually uh, pretty, pretty is flux. So you see I have this really simple program on the right here. Uh, I can mutate it, my data in different ways. I can reset it and, and go along with that. So the point that I want to show on this slide is uh, with a, a flux-like architecture, uh, you, you change how you think about your program. You have some giant application state, some, some model that represents what you're viewing. And in this case, it's just the current value. I just have a string, that's all I need to rep represent this view. Uh, I have a defined set of ways of changing that model, so I can update that string, reset it, change it to all caps or all lowercase. And then I have some function that I provide to Elm saying, depending on what action the view dispatches to me, uh, I'm going to change that model in different ways. More so, I'm going to return a new model because it's immutable uh, based on what that action is. So to send uh, like two uppercase or two lowercase the model, and again, the declarative view at the bottom. Again, I realize this is, you're not going to understand the syntax and hope you can pick out little pieces. My, my goal here is to you know, get you kind of excited about, oh, that, that's kind of a neat way of doing it, and uh, go explore it yourself. Uh, so it kind of just leaves Elm up, up to the task of doing things performantly and uh, let, lets the developer think more abstractly and do things that, that are more, a, little more, a little bit more high level. Um, this last example I want to show is, uh, if you've ever seen Redux DevTools, this is what inspired Redux DevTools. It's a time travel uh, debugger. And I've got Mario down here, so it's just a, a simple debugger. You see on the right side there, uh, I've got watch expressions, and so if I go left and right, it shows I'm hitting left and right on my arrow keys, if I hit up and down, um, it shows the position of Mario. And you'll see this number on the top right here. It's counting up very, very quickly. That's because this is a, a flux-like architecture, and it's dispatching lots of blocks and lots, sorry, lots and lots of actions because this is basically a physics simulation. Um, and so there's lots of other cool things about this. For example, actually, let me show you something I did. I, I put a bug in here. Uh, I thought I put a bug in here. Let me re-enter that bug in here. It helps to refresh the page. All right, reload that. All right. So this is bad. Um, Mario should not be able to do that, right? So what you can do is you can pause the application because flux like architectures give you like a, a state machine basically. You can grab this guy and traverse backwards in time and go forward in time. Uh, not only that, but this is a, a visual example. So you can actually, uh, I can't see the cursor here. Um, see kind of a, a ghost image of where Mario was, is, and will be, and play that along. 
Uh, still some more cool things. Uh, you can actually hot reload the state here. So this is the value for gravity, and I'm going to change this very slightly. And you'll notice it live reloads like that. Uh, and the bug actually isn't present there. And it turns out this bug only appears when gravity is in increments of 0 0.5. So when I get to 5 here, you'll see uh, Mario double jumps again. Um, and so what you can do here is you can, uh, as a developer, uh, look at some bug or develop some feature, say, oh, uh, I see Mario's doing something really stupid here. It turns out when he's jumping, he should only be able to jump when his uh, Y position is zero, not when his vertical velocity is zero. So I change that, it fixes the bug, and, and that's that. Now I can go back here and, and play some more, and uh, it's Mario gone again. Apparently, uh, I'm not doing anything, so he's jumping on his own. I don't know what's happening there. <laughs> That's a neat feature. Um, <laughs> like I said, I, I know you're not going to understand all of this from the get-go, uh, but I, I'm trying to get you excited that Elm is something worth looking into. You just saw a presentation on functional programming. Uh, there are several benefits to it, and uh, I hope you check it out. So that's all I have for Elm. Are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, this debugger, is this like a single pane web app essentially that runs on top of like the Elm? Like how, how that, what is this debugger? Uh, so, I mean, this is an online debugger when you run it uh, locally. Uh, I don't know the, the technology behind it, but you basically just navigate to a web page. It's either the, uh, the non-debugger version, just the, you know, the, the production version, or uh, the debugger version, in which case you, uh, you don't get quite the split view, um, but it does watch your code, and so you can change your code, save the file, it'll watch it, automatically update it. I guess I didn't catch how much is Elm tied to JavaScript, or is it just this is like a demo thing? Elm compiles to JavaScript. It compiles it, okay. So behind the scenes, it's compiling and then rendering the compiled version on the right side okay. here. Yeah? Okay, I don't know too much about functional programming, but I'm just wondering, like, um, is there not a loop? There's just a. There's just a new uh, model being created every time for this for the Mario, like just for Mario, or is there something else going on that I don't? Yeah, and it, it's hard to explain in a very short amount of time. But basically, yes, there's there's something uh, behind the scenes that's keeping track of a new version of Mario and a new version of Mario every time there's a new action dispatch, which in this case is every time a time step happens. And so if you happen to be pressing like the left key, it'll take that time step, it'll take the fact that you press the left key, it'll update Mario's X position, and by update, I mean it'll return a new version of Mario, a new model of Mario, uh, with a new horizontal position. Um, but the, the mutations are kind of hidden behind the scenes away from you. You just say how to mutate Mario, uh, but not actually the, the part of swapping out the state there. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I tried to do my best there, yeah. Would that make the memory usage swell? So, with immutable data, I'll try to do this as quickly as possible. Uh, imagine uh, a tree, and you want to change something at level three. What that'll do is it'll swap out that node and its children, actually just that node and all of its parents, but the new version of that data structure will be, uh, it'll reuse all the other branches as much as possible. And so, in, in unintelligent implementations of immutability, yes, it'd be inefficient, but uh, not with like persistent data structures is what that's called. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Looks like that's it. So thanks, everyone.